friends, fellow earthlings, and explorers of all ages, and welcome to Ask an Astrobiologist, the show that celebrates the science and the scientists involved in our quest to understand the nature of life. As usual, I'm your host, Dr. Graham, the Cosmobiologist Lau, and we are brought to you by the NASA Astrobiology Program and Seganet.org. As usual, we're going to give a huge shout out to all of you watching online live right now on YouTube, as well as those watching later in the recorded video. We appreciate all of your support in the show, engaging with us, engaging with our guests, asking questions, and trying to figure out more about this whole process of understanding life. This month, we're going to give a huge shout out to Thunderbird on Twitter for asking an awesome question of our guests and responding to our polls. We have a lot of fun with these polls every month, and so I'm glad so many of you tune in and answer our questions and get involved in the conversation. There's so much for us to share there. Now, today's episode is going to be entirely excellent. I'm super excited for it because it's going to feature my friend and colleague, Dr. Jim Cleves. Dr. Cleves has built his career around studying the origins of life on Earth and the potential for life beyond. He's been driven by the question of how and when does chemistry become biology? Jim is a senior research investigator at Blue Marble Space Institute of Science. He's the president of ISSL, the International Society for the Study of the Origin of Life. And recently, he became a professor and department chair in chemistry at Howard University. So I hope all of you will join me in welcoming Dr. Jim Cleves to the show. Jim, thank you for joining us. Well, thank you for having me, Graham. So really nice event. Yeah, I'm super excited to have you here just to chat about your life and your research, ask you some fun questions and give our audience a chance to ask some questions as well. I know some are coming in already in the chat on YouTube, and I'm sure more will pour in as we have our conversation first with me. Um, I love for all of our guests to start off the episode just by sharing what got them involved in science. What was their origin story as a science superhero to bring them to where they are? And so can you share with our audience what inspired you to get involved in the career you pursued? Um, I, th- I think it was a little bit by happenstance that, uh, you know, I always liked to spend time in the woods when I was a kid. I used to play hooky a lot to go fishing down at a creek near our house. <coughs> and I just, um, by various other accidents, ended up having jobs that put me in the woods a lot. I was, I worked as a, you know, a wild mushroom picker for a while, started a business, did that, which put me through college. Um, and in college, I wanted to be an environmental science major. And I just, it, it turned out to be something that was really diffuse between politics and sociology and biology. And, you know, it was really more about, you know, management issues. And I also thought about being a philosophy major, and that just seemed too esoteric to me when I finally got into the nuts and bolts of it. And so I, I found that the, the science classes were, were really sucking me in, you know, biology. And, um, you know, the, 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 Biology 101 textbook you get that's 1,500 pages. Um, the first chapter is what is biology, what is life, and all this. And it had a little sidebar that was about um, an interview with Stanley Miller, who had done the Miller Urey experiment. You know, so that's you know, if you open the book, that's the first thing you read. And I was like, well, that's that's unusual, right? And so I got it got into that more, and I. I um, I took a really good organic chemistry class that was not for pre-meds. It was for chemistry majors. So I think it, it went much deeper and then you had more time to kind of digest what is beautiful about organic chemistry. Um, and then I went and got a job at UC San Francisco when I graduated as a lab tech. And I, I just hated it. I tell you the truth. <laughs> it was a really small lab. I just, I, I liked the work, but this, the work environment was just not. I love San Francisco. Um, So I went into contracting. This was about when the Oakland Hills fire started. And um, 
you know, we were making, we were making pretty good money, honestly, for that time. <laughs> but I realized, you know, you wake up every day and you do it. I, I said, I'm going to wake up in 10 years and I'm going to still be doing this, you know, if I don't do something. So um, I answered an ad for a job at NASA Ames, which was to euthanize mice that came back from experiments on the, uh, the space station. And I didn't, I'd never, you know, I'm not really into killing things. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so I went over and talked to the to the guy, and I said, you know, I really didn't know NASA did this kind of stuff. And he said, oh yeah, we do all sorts of things. Um, he goes, but the guys doing the really freaky stuff are in San Diego. And I, I go, what's the really freaky stuff? And he goes, oh yeah, this you know Stanley Miller and those guys have the Center for Exobiology, you know, what, trying to understand origin of life and how to find aliens. All this. And I go, really, you know. So I thought I would just apply to graduate school and check that out. Um, and it, it turned out that to do that kind of work, I had to be a chemistry major in order to do a degree in, in chemistry. So I said, well, that's what I got to do. And that's what I'm going to do. And, uh, you know, it just I, I tell people it's like, you know, going to a family reunion where you meet all of these relatives you didn't know you had. But you can immediately see the connection. Right. The, the family resemblance. And um, yeah, so that was 1996. And, and here we are, 28 years later. That's yeah, incredible. And I, I love that transition from like you know being young and enjoying being outdoors and in, interested in the environment, and then realizing there's a draw for you in chemistry. And you know you won't hear many people say that they love organic chemistry. A lot of people have issues there with like memorizing you know all these different processes and memorizing all these different names for molecular structures and such. I also loved organic chemistry yeah. though. Um, you know, there's so much in chemistry that's so beautiful for understanding the world around us. Um, do you think, you know, during the process of learning, you know, about chemistry, organic chemistry, biochemistry, all of this, that that's where that, that really that, that connection came for you and kind of seeing that, that connection to the origin of life, the evolution of life through time, through chemistry? Yeah, I mean, well, I think once you, once you train as a chemist, you start seeing everything as chemistry, right? That's, uh, <laughs> which, you know, I guess physicists argue everything is physics. Um, but yeah, I think chemistry is probably the right kind of scale for a lot of the, 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 the rates of change that we observe is interesting, right? Tend to be on a kind of chemical scale. So, Yeah, absolutely. Um, now, you know, during grad school, you worked with Stanley Miller, and then afterwards, you went to the Carnegie Institute and worked with Robert Hazen for a while. Um, folks here watching might know that Robert Hazen has been involved in things like the mineralogical evolution of worlds and things like that. Um, is that really when you kind of brought like geochemistry and that kind of realm into your your understanding as well? Well, so in, in between that, I did a postdoc at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography with Jeff Beta. And he had been applying um, amino acid racemization to dating geological samples, right? So it's it's a good chronometer for things that are like thousands of years old. It's It's older than carbon-14, I think, but not as old as some other systems. And so, you know, he just had all this, it was right on the beach, right? So we were always doing stuff that, hey, you want to test this idea? Go down to the beach and grab some sand, you know, or grab some seawater. Let's measure what's in it. And I think that's where I, I first got more connected to earth science and, and stuff. But um, yeah, it, since that happened, it's just been more and more and more um, tied in. Yeah, fantastic. I mean, I love an astrobiology. We have these connections of of different disciplines, different ways of understanding from biology and chemistry, geology, and things like philosophy and sociology that really all come together to this realm of astrobiology and kind of asking these big questions about, you know, where did life come from? And why are we here? Is there is there life out there? And so I think it's so crucial for young people kind of as they develop careers in astrobiology to be open to these different experiences. Um, I wonder if you can speak to that. You know, if you had to give some advice, you know, to maybe a young undergraduate student watching right now who is interested in branching out and learning more, what would you say to them? I mean, I think I think just as a well, as a scientist in particular and as a human being in general, um, just you know, being open to all of the information and experience you can get your hands on to really understand the world around you is is it's the key, right? Um, you never know. I mean, the body of information you have to understand to really be effective as a scientist means you can't, you never know what two things are going to connect, right? And be the crucial connection, right? So you have to be efficient at sorting through information, but you have to be open to taking it all in, I think. And, you know, it goes, it goes double for 
for meeting people, right? And being open to hearing what they say. Um, a lot of the best things that have happened to me in my career have been just accidental encounters with people at meetings or parking lots, waiting for the bus, this kind of stuff. Yeah, it's fantastic. Like serendipity. Serendipity, absolutely. Yeah. I love that. And so you've also done some work previously as a professor uh, and a researcher at Tokyo Tech and through the Earth Life Science Institute. Um, I wonder for our audience if you can talk about some of the differences, uh, different ways of collaborating and doing research while working in Japan compared to having worked so much time in the U.S. Yeah, so um, this was about 20, end of 2012. Um, I, again, accidentally met a guy who <laughs> was involved with starting this new institute in Japan. He, he said, do you want to you want a job or are you going to work in Japan? I said, yes. And I, I was really skeptical when I first went because there was nothing there. And there didn't seem to be anybody who really worked in this field. And I, you know, I'd already been in it for a while. So, um, you know, it, the whole thing struck me as very odd. But sure enough, we built this a whole building. It's a, you know, a large office building, a couple, of, I don't know, 200 yards long and six stories top to bottom. Um, that specializes in combining planetary science and origins of life kind of questions. Um, and, you know, part of, part of the point was to try to internationalize Japanese science. So this is one thing we really focused on was it not being about the science itself and bringing in as many diverse people from around the world to talk about these questions and try to network, um, you know, as opposed to just reinverting you know, knowledge locally. So, and so you know, through LC and through these various places you've worked as a postdoc and grad school, undergrad, different positions you've had and research you've done. Yeah, I wonder, in your viewpoint, how has the question of life's origins changed over time? Either like during your career or just in general, how have you seen this question changing? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, yeah, so I guess I, I've been at it for a little while now. Um, and I, you know, I've, I've been interested in the kind of historical change in scientific ideas. Um, you know, a lot of things like this don't even have a. It wasn't a question till a certain point, right? Or a scientific question till maybe the middle of the 19th century. And you know what people like Pasteur were thinking about um, versus people like Miller versus people like the ones who are active in the field today. There's, there's some commonalities, but there's some changes, and, and some of them reflect, I think, changes in technology, right? But also, you know, obviously, Pasteur couldn't think about an RNA world, right? It just wasn't a thing in his, his scientific milieu, right? Um, whereas that's, you know, a leading theory today. And then we see, we see other new, like, camps, like hydrothermal vent sort of models, that are springing out of things that were discovered in the 1970s. Um, and, you know, there'll probably be new ones tomorrow until we, until we find a really comprehensive answer, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's, there's much for us to learn about, you know, when chemistry becomes biology, this question that's driven you. And also for us, like when does biology in general become biology, like life as we know it here on earth. Right. Uh, I pulled my, my audience on Twitter and I, I, I offered them, uh, a poll about what features of life as we know it here on Earth Tell me might it. be least likely to be found uh, amongst alien life. And I offered things like information systems, carbon-based chemistry, water as a solvent, multicellular life. Um, of the options, people picked multicellular life the most as the least likely thing to happen. Um, maybe that there's more single-celled biospheres out there, perhaps. Yeah. Um, I wonder for you, like, what, what is your take? What, what do you think is maybe the least likely thing that we have in life on earth that might happen elsewhere. Hmm. Actually, I, I'm going to, I'm going to say our particular genetic code, but that's, you know, I could be wrong. <laughs> you know, I, I wonder, I mean, you know, when you look at, I don't know if you've read like Oparin's little book, when you see the way he kind of deduces the earliest features of life, you know, he's like, well, it's got to be cellular and it's a heterotroph and this, um, if those aren't thought structures that we all just kind of naturally fall down, you know, and it's hard for us to get outside of them. Yeah. Once you know something yeah. about biology, right? Yeah. 
Yeah, and it seems like maybe if we, if we found you know DNA and RNA using the same bases and using the same code amongst some alien life form that we could you know prove indisputably it was an alien, yeah. it almost feels like we would have to have some kind of shared origin then. Otherwise, it seems more likely that alien life would have you know an information system, but more likely yeah. a very different information system. Or I mean, or you know, it could be that you know you can think of evolution kind of tinkering in this molecular space. And it's always kind of making a slightly progressive meandering, right? That it all kind of meanders to the same place at the end. And that would be, that would be weird too, right? So, and interesting. Very cool. Yeah. And in, in this topic too of like, you know, what things can we look for for alien life through our astrobiology mission, missions, through NASA and our instruments, you know, if we're trying to look for life out there, Life could be very different from what we have here. And so we have this newer idea that's kind of come around a lot more lately, at least in the, 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 the language of agnostic biosignatures. Hmm. Um, would you mind explaining to our audience how you view agnostic biosignatures and the search for alien life? So, so I think um, when you talk about looking for alien life, you're assuming that somehow it's a thing that makes copies of itself that separates itself from its environment in some way, Right. So it's it's a distinct phenomenon, um, and then it's made out of something, right? And I guess you know, again, bringing the chemist bias, we assume it's going to be made out of chemicals. I think there's some valid reasons to think that it's going to be made out of organic chemicals, right? And then you know that naturally puts itself into the our realm of analytical chemistry. We build instruments to measure organic chemicals. If we can measure ours, we can measure theirs. But how are we going to recognize that set of chemicals as a, a cohesive, um, as the cohesive elements of a living system, right? Especially if they're different elements, right? And so I think what we're what people are starting to think is that it, you want to be able to detect the system of things, whatever the things actually are, um, but that they're going to be coordinated in some way um, that makes them stand out from their environment. And and that's the kind of methodology we're trying to develop is how do you how do you pick out that signal from background noise? Yeah. And it's super important, like understanding what things are happening biotically, what things could happen biologically, and how we can tell the difference um, between them. Yeah. Um, I do like that you have kind of suggested too, like an idea of trying to characterize life, um, of understanding that it, you know it's it's replicating, it has some material that it's made out of, and it takes up some space in the environment and does something in the environment. Um, we also polled our audience on YouTube to ask them, you know, in trying to define or characterize life, which, you know, we don't actually have a set definition of life. It's been yeah. a really intriguing debate in the philosophy of astrobiology is trying to know, can we define life? Um, we asked people what they think might be the most trouble or, or offer us the most trouble in trying to define life or characterize life. And we offered options like viruses, artificial intelligence, replication of crystals, uh, sterile organisms that can't reproduce or something else. Um, the one that people selected the most was viruses. Hmm. Um, I think, you know, even when I was a kid in elementary school and in middle school, like we were being told, you know, viruses are not life, but then, you know, you go into college and you start studying these things. Now there's a lot of questions about what viruses really are as biological machines. Um, so do you think it's, it's of value to, to argue over defining life or how do you view this kind of realm of trying to characterize life and, and do you think things like viruses really do pose the most trouble in trying to understand what life is? Well, that's such a good question. I mean, it, uh, viruses are not a separate thing from life, I would say. They're, they're a biological phenomenon if they're not living, right? Um, I, we get stuck in words a lot, and I think most biologists kind of recognize the, the continuum that is organismality. You know what I mean? That, you know, you have... Um, communities and things that are sort of fluid. You have sexuality, you have all these things that kind of blur the boundaries between life and organism. And um, one of my favorite science fiction books is uh, Solaris. I don't know if you've read it, but like the whole planet is some sort of living thing and they, they just can't make heads or tails of it, right? Um, so you know, I think I think sometimes focusing on the the little odd, odds and ends on Earth might be 
maybe I'm agreeing with your poll. It might be the wrong place to, to focus your energy, right? Yeah, it's intriguing. Yeah, I, I love Stanislav Lem's writing, and and you know, there's been two movies made from Solaris, which is pretty cool. Um, both are worth a watch for our audience if you're interested in astrobiology relevant film. Um, I, I love this idea of being stuck in words too. That you know, language itself is also kind of guiding how we think about the search for alien life. And in prep for the show, you mentioned you know, kind of your your interest in the evolution of language and how language has changed. We, we discussed a little bit things like levels of fidelity and how language is allowed to change, and, and language itself is very you know, fluid and moving and dynamic. And then when you think about things like a genetic code, yeah. it seems like it kind of got gets locked in and stays very much that way with some levels of fluidity. Um, I wonder if you can speak to that, the importance of evolutionary processes and different kinds of information systems. Hmm. Yeah. I, you know, one of the things that's really interesting to me now, I, you know, so I get a lot of, when, when students have a complaint, I'm the, I'm the complaints office, you know, we have people from all over the country and trying to guess what state they're from <laughs> by the subtleties of their accent is um, is a fun game, right? It is, often you can be really accurate with this, right? So, I mean, it just points to the, the point of how fluid that kind of information transfer is at the level of language. Um, yeah, I don't know. Maybe I'm, I'm going to go. I think this this concept of how you store information and how symbolisms evolve over time is going to end up being one of the really crucial questions in this field. And I'm not, I'm not a big, I'm not anti RNA world, but I think it may have been itself already the outcome of a process of symbol encoding that once it got to that, it was a very efficient way of storing genetic information, but maybe not the original way, if that's, that getting at the question you're asking or is it? yeah yeah makes a lot of sense yeah and in some of your more recent work as well you've also been exploring like using machine learning and artificial intelligence and kind of exploring for agnostic biosignatures and kind of under, trying to understand how that technology is working what got you interested in that realm of using kind of these machine learning models and systems to to now apply that to understanding you know what we're looking at if we're looking for life out there yeah so uh, i mean it's a continuum of a lot of things of um you know, there's the idea that frequency distributions are, are a tool that's used in cryptography a lot, right? That you can actually tell if you were just to take a French novel and an English novel and just count the letter distributions, um, just forget about all the information, forget the storyline, forget everything, who wrote it, whatever. You would be able to tell that one was English and one was French just from the letter distributions, right? That certain letters occur more frequently in English usage. Than they do in French. Um, so that's that's the kind of idea that maybe, as far as agnostic biosignatures go, if you could measure a set of molecules, you would be able to say, well, this is obviously a terrestrial distribution of things, right? And you find another distribution, you say, well, this is a different language, whatever it is. I don't I don't know what the code is. I don't know what it's saying, but it's a language and it's not our language, right? And so. You know, what we do as organic, as analytical chemists is we, we, you know, measure things. As geochemists, we measure dirt and things like this. And um, there, are, there are signals that are very common to terrestrial biology because of the commonalities of cell structure and terrestrial metabolism and so on. And, you know, people have been interested in studying how things degrade in the environment for a long time. Um, it's kind of a natural methodology to apply to this problem, right? And so you, you can find a kind of cluster of things using machine learning algorithms that really show that terrestrial stuff falls in a unique phase space um, that can be measured with a, with a chromatographic equipment and a mass spectrometer, right? So do you think we should expect that, that there will be some things from alien life or at least in, in signs of possible alien life that will fall into that same phase space? Or are we able to use those models to also make some make some ideas or speculations about other spaces where we might start finding some commonalities? Yeah, well, yeah that, that's a good question. I mean, I think um, we have some measurements of like things we pretty sure are a biological organic compounds, like things like meteorites, um, so even some meteorites from Mars and so on. Um, and they, they do tend to cluster in a different place in that phase space, right? And, you know, to the best of our knowledge, it's not living. 
maybe, maybe there is some sign in there. We just don't know what we're looking at, but it falls in a different phase space. And, you know, interestingly, with this, the, the most recent work we did, we found that there's actually a, a kind of no-go zone that neither of those things falls in, right? And it might, you know, it would be interesting if in the future we measure something and it falls in that that space that we know, nothing we know of occupies, right? So. Mm. Yeah, very intriguing. Now, um, to change gears a little bit, um, you're now the president of ISIL, this International Society for the Study of the Origin of Life. Um, it's been around for quite some time. Um, and, you know, for myself, just in my own career, I've been watching a lot more, you know, groups coming together, people coming together with ideas about the origins of life who are involved in the biology and the chemistry and the geology, the physics, you know, all of these different realms. And it, so it's nice to see ISIL and other organizations coming around, especially bringing in early career researchers to help them get involved in this larger networking for answering this question. Um, in your viewpoint, you know, what, what is the value that you see ISIL and organizations like it moving forward and kind of carrying the torch of looking for the origins of life? Wait, what, can I do a shameless plug for ISIL? Please do. All right. Yeah. So for those watching who don't know, ISIL, I-S-S-O-L, it's the International Society for the Study of the Origins of Life. Um, it traces its origin back to 1957. They got a meeting in Moscow and it was really this effort, you know, the Cold War was in full swing. Um, there was a sort of, you know, stove piping of nations and camps, uh, which was hindering the exchange of scientific knowledge. And some scientists got together and recognized that this was a bad thing for, for fundamental topics of interest to humanity, like the origin of life. And they held a meeting and kind of did this informally. And then I think they incorporated in the early 70s as a formal society. Um, we meet every three years to discuss topics of interest to the original life. We have very low membership dues. Uh, everybody can join. We use those dues to support student travel to the triennial meetings. Um, most ISIL people, I want to say, are chemists. That's, I think a lot of people come at the problem as chemical problem. A lot of biologists. Um, more and more geologists and planetary scientists. We actually held our last meeting jointly with the um, International Astronomical Union Astrobiology Division. So I think I think there's more of a, a, a recognition over time that there's a lot to be had from the dialogue between astronomy and physical sciences. You know, and so I see it, I see it evolving. Um, in that direction, especially with all of the discoveries of exoplanets that are taking place these days. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. It's so cool to see that growth and see these changes um, and people coming together to, to network and share their ideas. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I love your point, too, about, you know, the, this, this stovepiping of science and these different national kind of, you know, ideas. I and mean, we really do need to come together. And so science itself has often broken boundaries. Space exploration itself has often broken those boundaries. Yeah. To bring us together to answer these big questions. And it's so crucial for, for the future of everyone on the planet that we can do that. Yeah, yeah, it really is. I mean, I, I, it's one of the things I love about Blue Marble is it's just so um, welcoming, right, to anybody, every human on the planet, right? So it's... Yeah. Yeah, so we should talk then about Blue Marble Space yeah. Institute of Science. Um, you know, you've been an, an affiliate researcher with our organization, just like I am, for quite some time. Um on, as the director of our Young Scientist program myself, um, I'd love to point out to our audience that you've been a mentor for projects over the last several years in our Young Scientist program, and you've brought on you know these undergrad and recent you know grad students or, or you know post undergrad students into your projects over the past several years, and it's been really fun for me to watch that you've done a, a remarkable job of having your past students come back in yeah. you know the, the the following years to help mentor the younger students. And so I wonder, first off, if you can speak to the value of these projects you've offered, and then also speak to how you envision yourself, like teaching these young people to become mentors themselves. Um, well, I think the value is just amazing. I mean, I think um, there's so many people on earth who have so much talent and knowledge and intelligence, and they're just looking for venues where they can, you know, express it and, and contribute. And I think the YSP really is such a great venue for that. And especially in that it allows virtual collaboration, right? I think this is a, not only good for the planet, it's good for building 
connections among humanity, right? Um, and I've just I've been just so lucky to work with all of these people. Um, there are so many brilliant people who've contributed amazing things, you know, at such a young age. Um, so yeah, I, 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 so many people, when I look back on my life, helped me along the way when I was younger, right? It's nice to be able to, to pay it back. And, and I think, you know, that spirit, um, abounds at Blue Marble. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, I love hearing that. Um, so, and now you have a new role at Howard University, where you're now a professor and the department chair uh, in chemistry. Um, you know, this has been, you know, this, this long career arc that you've had, and now you're kind of back in this realm of academia and being a professor, department chair. Um, I wonder if you can speak now to to how you envision your role um, in someone leading forward a department of chemistry in a university like Howard. Yeah, um, I think I, I guess I see my my main role is to make people's jobs easier and help them be more effective at what they're trying to do and um you know try to remove obstacles to people doing their best work right and doing their best teaching doing their best mentoring um and that's that's what i strive to do it's it's you know it's a challenge so I mean, you know yeah yeah it's, it's it's great it's it's people are endlessly surprising right mm, absolutely um so i do want to get to our fast and the light segment uh here in a moment and i also want to answer our audience's questions i see more coming in from youtube and we have a few from twitter um a few things i want to ask you first though one i'd, I'd be remiss if i didn't ask about you being on the famous game show who wants to be a millionaire when you were a graduate <laughs> yeah, student you found that out, huh? um yeah and so we shared it online Already, that was that was the fifteen minutes. Huh? <laughs> yeah, that was um, it. Or is this it? I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, I mean, hey, ask an astrobiologist. Maybe, yeah. maybe now this is it. Yeah, yeah. Um, but being on Who Wants to Be a Millionaire must have been exciting. Maybe you know, challenging. Uh, you were a graduate student. I wonder if you just give us an idea. What oh was that like God. as a graduate student to to be on a game show that's super famous? So it was really funny. My my, I was working in the lab, you know, fixing an HPLC, and the phone rang, and. It was my brother, and he said, "What are you doing this weekend?" I said, "I'm fixing this HPLC." <laughs> he goes, "You got to go to Las Vegas." And I go, "Why?" He said, "I got you an audition for this game show." You know, you know, as guys, I didn't have a lot of money. I was like, "Well, I don't think I am doing that, honestly." And he's like, "Yeah, you got to go." So I was like, ah, "All right." And so yeah, I bought a ticket. You know, it's Southwest Airlines. It was like twenty five bucks to fly to Las Vegas from San Diego, and I went, and they. You know, there were there are hundreds of people. They do this first round thing where you take a test and then you have to do a mock up. And I think, you know, the one thing that really kills people is they they freeze up when they have to talk in public. And I had already had to be a teaching assistant for like three or four years, so I, I'd kind of gotten over that fear of seeming stupid. You know what I mean? And uh, I got through, and they they flew us out to New York. And it was just the craziest thing. It was, you know, at the last three minutes, you know, we're still waiting. Somebody failed out and there was one more of those fast things. And I just got in. So, so I had to stay over for another thing. You know, it was just like, this, just the craziest feeling, right? You know, like that, that show was like a big thing when it was on, you know, you suddenly realize like, man, millions of people watching this. Um, I sure hope I don't say something stupid, right? <laughs> And so, you know, we got out for the day. We're like, well, we need to go to the bar <laughs> to drink, right? So I was with my brother. We get in the elevator. And who's in the elevator? Um, LeVar Burton, right? Which was like, you know, like, of course, everything else today is crazy. So, of course, you just got into an elevator with LeVar Burton. And my brother was a really big fan of reading Rainbow, you know? And he says, oh, my God, you know, Mr. Burton, I'm such a huge fan of your show. And I think at that time, the, the Star Trek was that he was on was on, right? He's like, oh, yeah, a lot of people like Star Trek. I said, oh, man, the um, Reading Rainbow. So amazing. And this is a grown, grown man. You know, he's like, yeah, you watch a lot of Reading Rainbow, do you? <laughs> he said, yeah, I love the theme song. It's so inspirational. And I think he's starting to think that he was uh, goosing him, you know. So he says, okay, sing the song. And I said, I, I, I can't, you know, I don't, I don't sing. And he goes, yeah, that's what I thought. You know? 
Then we get home and had a beer. And then you see Lavar Bird across the, the thing. He says, hey, hey, I'm ready to sing the song now. <laughs> <laughs> So they, 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 you know, they were arm in arm singing the Reading Rainbow song together. I think that was the highlight of the whole experience to me. Watching wow, that it. is incredible. It was a hoot. <laughs> yeah, it was crazy. It was really weird though when I uh, when I came back, um, people would start recognizing you in public, which is really weird. You know, like you're mm-hmm. standing around minding your own business, and somebody goes, you know. Yeah, no kidding. I mean, that was a big show at that time. I mean, I remember watching it, you know, actively. Um, And so I I do want to go to Faster Than Light here in just a moment. Um, But, you know, you do incredible things beyond science, too. Um, You know, we we spoke before the show, you're interested in playing music. You do a lot of gardening, which is incredible. Um, And also getting out in nature and and going out into the woods, um, connecting back to your childhood, spending time outdoors. Um, Where is the value in that for you? These, These things that you do, gardening and playing music and going outdoors, how does that play into your your life? What, what rounds you out as Jim? Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I mean, I just I love um, you know, the, the cool thing about gardening is there's a, there's a certain amount you can do, but then a certain amount of it is up to the organism to behave and thrive as it as it can, right? And to understand why and how you can contribute to that is a it's just a mesmerizing process, you know. Um, and I, you know, as far as as music, I just it's another one of these combinatorial spaces, right? Where there's just endless room for variety and, and discovery, right? So I think that's where these things all tie together. Yeah. Yeah. That's remarkable. Yeah. Um, I love it so much. Um, it's been such fun for me talking with you, but yeah, now I want to open up some other things. And so we have our faster than light segment. Um, so this is where I ask the same questions of our guests but, you know, with you know, very short 30 second or so answers about some different questions we have about the nature of life here on Earth and looking for life elsewhere, your career and all of these kinds of things. Um, we have a new question for this month that we're going to start adding in. And it's one that means a lot to me because I, I, you know, I started off as a nerd outdoors, too, in the woods. And I started off in biology. and I wanted to know more about what life is doing. I love hummingbirds and whales. And there's so many remarkable things that life on Earth does. And so for you, Jim, I wonder, what is your favorite thing that life on Earth does? Uh, I want to say tell stories. <laughs> cool. I think that's just a, such an amazing phenomenon. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. We are storytellers at heart. I mean, I'm, in mythology and understanding where we come from, um, we are storytellers. And I, I love that so much. Um, you know, recently there's been... Um, some idea that we might soon be able to communicate with whales. Oh, um, and so this is kind of about, about this idea of like, can we communicate with non-human, ter- you know, terrestrial beings? So, if you could communicate with any non-human organism on Earth, what would that organism be, and what would you want to talk about? I, I'd want to say cats, and I would like to know if it, it's as much fun as it looks like. <laughs> It, it, it looks like they're having a good time. I don't know. Absolutely. Okay. Um, so, you know, almost everyone who comes on the show in some way has been inspired by science fiction, fantasy, you know, stories. We told ourselves we are storytellers. What stories have inspired you to want to know more about the nature of life in the universe? Gosh. Um, you mean actual, like, written stories, movies, something like that? Well, I mean... Yeah, you, you mentioned Solaris. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, there's a, there's a bunch of different kinds of stories we, we share from our mythologies yeah. and, and placing ourselves in, in the universe in general. Also, to things like science fiction, fantasy, other yeah. stories. Yeah. I mean, you know, we are, we're all watching reruns of the 60s Star Trek when I, when I was a kid. That was kind of what was on. But I remember um, being about seven years old and we were practicing rundowns, you know, in baseball. And I took a ball to the head <laughs> and I was really upset. And they were like, okay, let's go see that new movie that just came out, was Star Wars. And that was just like something I, I don't think anybody had seen anything like that, right? At that moment, it just put space so big in your mind and this possibility of alien, you know, societies and things. It was just, I think that sparked a lot of kids off at that time. That and Close Encounters. I think that's the other one. 
Yeah, but Star Wars in general, the Star Wars universe has really opened up a lot of people's interest in space exploration um, and bringing kind of, you know, our, our mythology, our fantasy storytelling into space as well. Um, so change gears a little bit here, um, you know, and, and trying to understand, and we, we do have students watching um, who maybe are undergraduates or graduate students. Um, so for you, if you could go back to the beginning of your career and give yourself any piece of advice, what advice would you give? Do your best, right? Do your best and try hard. This is, you know, this is the one chance you get every, every day. So to live that day as best as you can, right? Um, yeah, I, I mean, you can't, you can't predict what's going to happen to you on any given day, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there's so much uncertainty out there, and our, our lives are short, and so we do have to make the most of them while we can and yeah. enjoy them. Yeah. Um. And so, kind of in that vein, you know, enjoying our lives and and placing ourselves in the cosmos. There's a lot changing right now in society, um, and so this question can apply to your science, what you studied, or it can be you know a little bit broader to anything in humanity or our future. What is something that excites you about the future? Oh. God, that's that's a nice question rather than what's the most terrifying thing you see looming on the horizon, right? Um, I think there's there's going to be advances in medicine that are going to make human life a lot better coming down the pipeline. So, I mean, they're happening every day now, right? But I think it's just going to keep happening, and that that's 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 a positive thing to look forward to. I think. Yeah, what, what what kinds of advances specific, specifically are you are you thinking about that might be the most meaningful for you, for your family, for your friends, for all of us? Um, really specific technologies. I, I mean, I think I think there are going to be um, cancer therapies that are going to render it a disease like I don't know polio or something like that. Right? It will just be rare that we can't treat it, um, and you know that'd be a big deal for a lot of people. We'll still die of something else, but Cancer, cancer is a drag, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I love that one scene in the one um, Star Trek uh, Four when the doctor heals the person's kidney. Um, she was going to go in dialysis, and instead he heals her and, and gives her a brand new kidney <laughs> with some simple medicine. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is things to look forward to, right? Um, plenty of things we got to be careful of, I suppose. At the same time. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you know, you've had, you know, you've, you've, you know, had so many experiences in your career from graduate school, there's postdoc experiences working in Tokyo, you know, back here in the U.S. now at Howard. Um, but, you know, given where things are right now, if you could restart your career today, what would you want to study? Oh, wow. You know, maybe economics, which was something that I hated as an undergraduate. I just didn't care about money. But now that I, I see it more in the vein of like kind of general systems theory, um, it's really intriguing to me. You know, it's all it has agents and rules and it oscillates and it has chaotic behavior and it does all of this stuff. Um, but maybe, you know, I could probably name 10 other things, too. There just isn't time for all of it. Right? Yeah. I mean, look at 10 lifetimes. <laughs> <laughs> Well, so from that, before I open up to the audience questions now, my favorite question of all for our Faster Than Light segment, what is an unbelievable science fact that still blows your mind? Hmm. Do you have one? I, I have several. So I do love that the, the moon, as it orbits around the Earth, doesn't just pull water towards itself and cause the tides yeah. due to gravitational interaction. It's also causing bulges in the Earth. And so as the moon is passing, it's actually causing us to lift up towards the moon a little yeah. bit as we interact with the moon and the sun together. I love that. It's just mind blowing. I, I think also the fact that the, the moon is just the same size as the sun in the sky at this particular point in time where we're conscious to appreciate it just seems uncanny to me, you know, and, it, it, you know, we're all getting excited about this eclipse coming up. It's this might be one of the only planets in the universe where this is a thing, right? So, yeah, it's so incredible. And we only have like 600 million years yet until that ends. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, is that right? I mean, how do you measure a certain number of arc seconds or something? Yeah, so it's, it's, a, little, it's a little bit at which the, the moon is moving away. Eventually, yeah, yeah. about 600 million years, it'll be so far away we'll that we won't actually have the, the, the full solar eclipse ever again. Yeah, 
But I mean, it's crazy, right? What are the chances? Yeah. So yeah, that's mind blowing. I yeah. love it. Um, so I, I do want to open up the audience questions now. Um, I'm going to start off with a question from Dr. Jim Pass. Uh, Dr. Pass is into astrosociology and asking questions of our cultural involvement in in our work. Um, he wants to know what risks might occur to humans settling on Mars over time, um, assuming that that viruses or living bacteria might exist there, um, and then for us to handling that during our research. You know, it's, that's a that's an interesting question. Um, I mean, I would think the, the big risks are going to be radiation and probably not being adapted to the gravity on Mars. But I'm not an expert in space physiology. Um, I remember this was when I was in graduate school. There was a scientist named Leslie Orgel who was big in Origins of Life, and he was telling a story how NASA had called him up to ask him what he thought the risk assessment was of returning samples from Mars in terms of introducing a contagion. And he said, uh, he was a you know, formal guy, he had British accent, he was British. And he said, I told them if they brought a rock back from Mars, I would eat it. <laughs> <laughs> so I think he, the, the odds, I mean, pathogens are so tuned to their hosts. The odds that a pathogen on Mars is tuned to a human biology might be kind of low. Hmm, interesting. Yeah, I mean, we do, we do have many pathogens on Earth, and only a small fraction of those impact humans. Yeah. Um, so that is a very good point. Um, this next question is really intriguing to me as well. From Daniel Lappin, uh, what are your creative processes that help you in your work in, in exploring prebiotic chemistry? They want to know if you have any contemplative creative processes that help you in your research or any embodied creative practices that, you, that, that help you in your research. I, I, think, I think going for a walk always helps. You know, just un unfocus your mind and just go and um, see where that takes you. And I, I think also um, I, library roulette, I just think is I swear by it, right? Go to a library and just unfocus your eyes and the first book that catches it, grab it and see what it's about, right? Yeah, I've, I've never done that before. I, I love that idea. I'll have to try that next time I go to the library. Uh, we have a question. So this is from our ambassador of the month, Thunderbird, um, who in answering that question um, about understanding, you know, defining life and understanding what key things might be different in alien life. They've said that that anthropocentrism is the biggest problem in their view, that we often only talk about things in terms of life as we know it. Yeah. Um, and they, they say, like, what if, what if it's a sentient light or a plasma or silicon based life or some form of consciousness like in Solaris that we can't comprehend? Yeah. Um, I, I love those what ifs. Uh, uh, how do you feel about that that question? Are, are we focusing too much on life as we know it? Yeah, you know, I think the thing that really keeps me awake at night is, you know, there's this idea of the singularity and that we might not be that far away from such a thing if it is a thing, right? And, you know, that's a relatively short period of time that we've been making tools and being human. What's on the other side of that thing? I don't even think we can think about it, right? And it, it's, I would think that the majority of civilizations are so far on the other side of that thing, if they exist, that it might be really hard to, yeah, even fathom what we're looking for, or how to communicate with it or understand it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's a good good point. One one of the uh, one of the users on Twitter who responded to my poll also brought this up that we might not even be able to recognize you know a, a sufficiently advanced life form. So much as in Arthur C. Clarke's quote that a sufficiently advanced technology would appear indistinguishable from magic, <laughs> maybe in some ways a sufficiently advanced civilization to us might kind of appear in a way that we actually can't comprehend it being yep. what it is. Yeah, I think about this a lot. I mean, how much. You know, even our perception of the natural world depends on on cognitive structures we have, right? And there's some things if we see them, we can't even integrate them into our environment, right? Conceptually, because we don't they don't exist for us, right? Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's jump to another question here. Hendrik Holst on YouTube has asked: uh, Given all known metabolic processes and corresponding molecular species interactions. Could an AI design a plausible minimalist organism that could arrive from non-biotic chemistry? Wow, that's a cool idea. Yes, why not? 
Um, maybe we're not. <laughs> I mean, we're, we've been trying to do some work on that kind of topic, not using AI, using more combinatorial computational tools. But yeah, that's a that's a cool idea. Um, yeah, I'm sure computers are going to be a big part of, of cracking these questions, honestly. So, and probably AI. So, yeah, absolutely. It's changing so much already, and it will change the future most certainly. Uh, we have a question from Arunava Padar, um, a past YSP participant. Um, Arunava wants to know if multicellularity is a strict requirement or prerequisite for intelligent life to originate in the universe. Wow. Um, or is or even single cellularity, right? <laughs> or cellularity itself? I don't know. I, I mean, I guess it was here. Um, what maybe it will depend on what we mean by multicellularity. Maybe colonialism is you know living in colonies is the equivalent, and that can lead to some pretty complex behaviors and cognition. I don't know. It's very intriguing to think, like, could it be possible? Could there be a Solaris planet where there's not really any cellular material at all, but yeah. it has a consciousness and an intelligence of its own? Um, and so, yeah, you know, it's very intriguing to think of what is possible based on what we know. What is consciousness um, you know, on top of that, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah. I mean, we talk about, you know, we don't have a definition, a definition of life. We don't really have a definition of intelligence nor a definition of consciousness either. And maybe we have to meet some some smart civilizations out there first before we can actually kind of answer any of those questions. Um, there is one question here I see coming in that I'm going to answer uh, from Era Ravi on YouTube. They want to know if uh, they, they say neutral bacteria. I think they just mean any any kind of general bacterium can mutate and transform into being an extremophile. Um, I think it's important to remember what this term extremophile just applies to something that can survive and thrive in extremes relevant to us. And so extremophiles on Earth, we use that term to apply to things that are extreme to human life. But to some organisms, that's just normal living. And we humans who breathe oxygen, you know, this crazy thing that breaks stuff down, we are the ones who are extreme. And so my answer would be, you know, yes, evolution finds ways to fill niches in the environment. And that includes pushing out to the extremes of what's possible for life. Um, but a very fun question. Uh, now, Jim, for you, uh, the the wise turtle, <laughs> uh, fun username, wants to know um, if our def if definition of if our definition of life is open enough to allow for non biological life. Oh, so non terrestrial biological life, I guess. Um, I think it is. I think it is. Um, you know, I think what did say? Chemical system NASA working definition is chemical system capable of imperfect self-replication um you know that captures darwinism and it captures reproduction and all that and you know that that could be a pretty broad class of things right yeah 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 i think the, the question too is like you know like post-biological life you know right now there's a big question are we going to create artificial general intelligence mm. in the near future here on earth you know and if we do is that life is that a living system um, we had Dr. Sue Schneider on the show many episodes ago now. It's, we're on episode 67 now. She was on some time back. But we had discussed you know, this idea of is alien life more likely to be post-biological yeah. and built out of these AI systems that, that living systems have created? And it's a good question. We just don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the you know, there's like the next year kind of future and the five years from now kind of future. But the, the 100, 500, 1,000 year kind of future, I think, is really tippy you know in ways that we can't really anticipate right now so yeah yeah every time we try to anticipate the future we are wrong <laughs> you know there's a yeah, lot of things we've yeah. been right about in science fiction and, and you know writing our stories you can look back at star trek and see technologies being built you can read em forsters the machine stops you know in the early 1900s predicting the internet there's all these things we can do but but yet we're almost always missing out on some key things that can happen. Yeah. And so it's amazing what, you know, what what comes into existence uh, through our progress and change. Yeah, I mean the way the ways that our technology changes us too, right? It's it's a uh, it's an interplay. Yeah. Um yeah. I I would I would I don't know what your consensus you guys came to, but I would guess that most life in the universe is post biological. It seems yeah, it seems likely. Yeah, if we're looking at, you know, human civilization, you know, if we're, we're thinking, you know, humans have been here for a couple hundred thousand years, human civilization, tens of thousands of years, 
and we're already maybe at the end of that. We're, we might be at the at that cusp where we're going to create a post biological life form. So maybe alien civilizations, once they emerge, don't have a very long period of time before they go to that. We we really don't know, but it is possible. I mean, I think the the, the space of time between agriculture and and written language and today is like. That's a blink of an eye, right? Um, we have two more questions I'd love to get to in the time that we have left. First off, uh, from Ruth on YouTube who's watching, um, they want to know um, about measuring and detecting molecules from abiotic sources from Earth and Mars um, and what the most common patterns are they share. I guess maybe the, the larger question they have is about abiotic sources of organic chemistry and how we, di how we distinguish those from biological materials yeah so so um well this kind of goes back to stanley miller i guess was you know one of the first examples of showing how you could abiologically make biological molecules um and we you know we know of a few processes it's basically different kinds of high energy radiation impacting different kinds of chemical mixtures and forcing them into excited states that recombine to make more complex molecules um there's there's a lot of nuance to the ways that can happen, right, and what the outcome is. So we probably need to get a, a pretty good survey of all the kind of background ways that can happen before we go looking for for biology. Yeah. yeah, that's the key right now is understanding, you know, abiotic sources, biological sources, and how we distinguish them. And that's it's it's crucial for looking for life out there both for life as we know it and for agnostic biosignatures as well. Um, we have one more question, and it's from our senior production assistant who's also watching and interacting in the chat on YouTube. Uh, Sarah, uh, not too long ago, went out on the Joides Resolution, um, which was doing some drilling in the Lost City hydrothermal vent field. Um, so Sarah is now also uh, an affiliate at BMSIS. And Sarah, um, she's very intrigued in the idea of there being an origin of life in vent systems. Um, either the high temperature hydrothermal vent systems or like Lost City Hydrothermal Field, which is a low temperature vent system here on Earth. And so she wants to know what your thoughts and feelings are maybe on the idea that life can originate in vent systems, both for here on Earth, as well as for our icy moons in the solar system. Yeah, that's, that's you know, one of the big, I, I mean, I want to say there's kind of two major models for where is the life. One is the kind of tidal pool model and one is the kind of bottom of the ocean model and uh you know they're they're both interesting right um if the the tidal pool one turns out to be right i'm not saying it will that doesn't bode so well for icy moons i guess if <laughs> the bottom of the ocean one kind of supports that idea a little bit more um i think i think we're still at the point where we have to keep an open mind about all the possibilities not rule anything out I love that. I mean, there's the question of why, why is Earth the only planet that seems to have life in the solar system, right? It's, yeah. yeah. I mean, as, as far as we know so far, we haven't found signs anywhere else yet. Yeah. We're yeah, still looking. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. But yeah, I love that, Jim. Let's keep an open mind. Let's work towards the future to keep answering questions about the past and about where we're going. Uh, thank you so much for joining me for this conversation, Jim. Thank you for having me. It was a lot of fun. I appreciate it. Yeah, it's been a huge pleasure. Uh, that's the end of our time now. For those who are tuning in right now live on YouTube or watching later on uh, the video recording, uh, if you'd like to learn more about our show, uh, get updates from NASA Astrobiology about really awesome events and opportunities and all the cool things that are going on across the astrobiology realm, please sign up for the mailing list. It's the best way to learn about what we have going on at Ask an Astrobiologist. Also, a great way to know what NASA Astrobiology is up to in general. Uh, so for Jim Cleves for joining us, thank you so much for your time, for answering our questions. To the audience watching, thank you so much for joining us uh, now and in the future. And remember, everyone, stay curious. Stay curious.